Police officer orders. Black man to open his trunk, unaware, he's secretly recording. Her Seattle lay quiet in the pre-dawn hours of May 17, 2020. Anthony Sims, a 35-year-old black delivery driver, navigated his supply-laden truck toward a 7-Eleven on his regular route. Approaching First Avenue and Cherry Street, he realized his headlights were off and quickly activated them. Simultaneously, Lieutenant Rebecca Brown of the Seattle Police Department, SPD, patrolled nearby. She spotted Sims's vehicle, noting the initially unlit headlights. A database check of the license plate suggested a possible match with a stolen vehicle report from Snohomish County. Brown radioed in, escalating the situation. Oblivious to the unfolding events, Sims parked at the 7-Eleven and exited his truck to begin his delivery. Brown suddenly activated her patrol car's emergency lights and, weapon drawn, ordered Sims back into his vehicle via the public address system. Sims complied, his pulse racing. Within moments, seven additional officers arrived, surrounding Sims's truck with drawn weapons. Some aimed directly at him, while others maintained a less aggressive stance. The scene had rapidly transformed into a high-risk vehicle stop. Sims, though terrified, maintained his composure in the truck. He knew to stay calm and comply. Unknown to the officers, Sims's dash camera was recording the incident, and he discreetly started his phone's audio and video recording as well. Lieutenant Brown approached cautiously, weapon drawn. Keep your hands visible, she ordered. Sims obeyed, placing his trembling hands on the steering wheel. Brown demanded his keys, which Sims handed over, then instructed him to exit the vehicle. As Sims complied, hands raised, Brown directed another officer to search the truck. Why are you searching my vehicle? I've done nothing wrong, Sims protested, his voice steady but laced with fear and frustration. We have reason to believe this vehicle is stolen, Brown replied tersely. Sims knew this was a mistake. His truck was properly registered with valid plates. He tried to explain, but the officers remained focused on their task. One took the keys from Brown and opened the trunk. Sims watched helplessly as they searched his belongings. Despite their thorough inspection, they found nothing suspicious. Sims's paperwork was in order, with no signs of illegal activity. Minutes later, Brown received a radio call. The dispatcher confirmed an error. The license plate wasn't stolen. Brown's expression tightened as she processed this. Turning to Sims, her face unreadable, she stated flatly, there was a mix-up with the license plate. Sims, furious but composed, asked firmly, May I leave now? Brown nodded, and the officers lowered their weapons, retreating. Sims returned to his truck, still recording, and drove away, his mind reeling from the incident. In the days that followed, Sims repeatedly analyzed the encounter. Convinced he'd been racially profiled, he decided to act. He engaged an attorney and filed a civil rights lawsuit against the Seattle Police Department, alleging racial discrimination and unlawful vehicle search. The case quickly gained momentum, attracting local and national media attention. Sims' dash camera footage and phone recordings served as compelling evidence, revealing the unnecessary force used and the apparent disregard for his rights. As the footage spread widely, it ignited public outrage and demands for police accountability. U.S. District Judge Tana Lin oversaw the case, finding substantial evidence supporting Sims' claims. She noted the SPD's lack of a high-risk vehicle stop policy, a critical oversight potentially enabling abuse. Judge Lin emphasized that a reasonable jury might conclude racial factors influence the officer's actions. The city's failure to train officers on force use during high-risk vehicle stops suggests deliberate indifference to constitutional rights, Judge Lin stated in her ruling. She denied the city's motion to dismiss, deeming biased policing a jury matter. The impending trial became central to Seattle's police reform discussions. Sims' attorneys, backed by the ACLU of Washington, argued his experience exemplified broader SPD issues, particularly the disproportionate targeting of black individuals. The trial exposed concerning SPD practices. Data revealed black people, despite comprising only 7% of Seattle's population, 
were significantly more likely to face armed police stops than white residents. Paradoxically, white individuals were more often armed in these encounters, yet black individuals faced more aggressive police responses. During proceedings, Lieutenant Brown claimed she couldn't determine the driver's race initially. However, Judge Lynn noted Brown only activated emergency lights and drew her weapon after Sims exited his vehicle, suggesting his race may have partially motivated the high-risk tactic. As Sims took the stand, tension filled the courtroom. He recounted the fear and humiliation of the stop, describing his unwarranted treatment as a criminal. Though his voice occasionally faltered, his determination was evident. He sought justice not only for himself, but for all who had endured similar injustices. The defense argued the officer's actions were necessary for safety, but Judge Lynn remained unconvinced, highlighting the unwarranted and unlawful search of Sim's trunk without a warrant. After days of deliberation, the jury found the city liable for the illegal search and determined Sims had been racially profiled. They awarded him substantial damages, acknowledging the incident's emotional and psychological impact. This verdict marked a turning point, igniting renewed calls for police reform in Seattle. Community leaders and activists rallied around Sims, using his case to push for change. The city and U.S. Justice Department faced increasing pressure to address systemic issues within the SPD and ensure officer accountability. In response, Seattle's Office of Police Accountability recommended developing a policy for high-risk vehicle stops emphasizing comprehensive use of force training. Initially resistant, police chief Adrian Diaz eventually conceded to these demands, recognizing the need for change to rebuild community trust. Sims ordeal and the subsequent trial underscored the ongoing struggle for racial justice and police accountability in America. Sims's courage in confronting injustice illuminated systemic issues requiring urgent attention. For Sims, the legal victory was bittersweet. While he achieved justice, the experience left enduring scars. He persisted in advocating for change, hoping his ordeal would prevent similar incidents. His story underscored the importance of vigilance and holding authorities accountable. Ultimately, Sims' covert recordings not only exposed the truth, but ignited a movement for change. His fight for justice became an inspiration motivating others to assert their rights in the face of adversity. The lessons from his case would continue to influence Seattle's path forward. Sims' story highlights crucial issues surrounding racial profiling, police power misuse, and accountability. It reveals how systemic problems in law enforcement can lead to race-based injustices. His experience emphasizes the need for comprehensive training and policies to prevent abuse and ensure lawful police conduct. The case also demonstrates the power of documentation and legal action in pursuing justice and reform. By defending his rights, Sims not only sought personal vindication, but sparked a broader dialogue on police practices and racial bias. His bravery and the ensuing legal battle underscore the vital role of vigilance and advocacy in addressing systemic injustices. Considering Sims' experience, we're prompted to examine our role in fostering accountability and fairness in local law enforcement. How can we actively support victims of systemic bias? Your insights and actions have the potential to drive significant change. We invite you to share your thoughts. What initiatives could promote transparency in policing within your community? How might we amplify the voices of those affected by racial profiling? What personal experiences have shaped your perspective on this issue? Your contributions to this dialogue are valuable. Please share your ideas, experiences, or proposed solutions in the comments section below.